Right. Welcome to the next lecture uh, from uh, Link, from the Link Data and Semantic Web course. And today we again have two topics. The first topic is um, about embedding uh, data into web pages. So how you can combine publishing data on the web and uh, web pages uh, or documents for reading by people. And uh, the second topic uh, will be about how you can use uh, RDF databases, uh, not just for querying, but also for data storage and uh, updating, uh, updating the database. And uh, then I'll um, show you three uh, of the mostly used RDF uh, stores uh, that are, yeah, well, the most commonly used uh, and therefore you can try them out yourselves for your data. Uh, but uh, uh, let's start with um, embedding um, data into uh, web pages. And there are multiple uh, approaches to this. Um, they come from different uh, communities um, and uh, they are, well, different approaches to the same thing. So the goal here is to um, combine web pages, um, documents for people, and uh, data, um, sometimes in RDF, sometimes in another data model, uh, but machine readable data containing a subset of the information available on the web page for, uh, for people. Um, and uh, because we already know RDF, the first approach I will talk about is RDFA which is the seventh and final standard serialization of the RDF data model. So we already talked about RDF turtle and RDF trig for quads, um, N triples and N quads. We talked about JSON-LD and RDF XML and RDFA is the seventh and final. And um, RDFA stands for RDF in attributes and those are HTML attributes. So, uh, in, in this part, we'll talk about how you can embed RDF data directly into HTML code of a web page. Um, the RDFA approach is not limited just to HTML. Uh, it can be used with any markup uh, or no, a, a bigger set of markup languages, such as XML or even SVG. So SVG is a data format for vector graphics on the web. Uh, it is based on XML, so uh, an SVG file is an XML file, and therefore you can annotate it um, so that uh, it includes uh, RDF data inside. So um, again, RDFA not limited just to HTML, even though I will show you how it works on uh, the case of HTML because that's the most common, but uh, there are specifications for embedding RDF uh, data into other markup language documents, such as XML or even SVG. Um, and the way uh, RDF is going to be embedded in the HTML code is through uh, usage of additional and reuse of some existing uh, attributes of the HTML elements. Um, this is because uh, common HTML parsers uh, ignore attributes which they don't understand so you can add your own attributes uh, with your own meaning uh, and a common html parser such as a web browser will simply ignore those uh, and display a regular html page but um, an application knowing how to parse rdfa uh, which is called a rdfa distiller um, but then again every decent library uh, supporting rdf uh, supports also RDFA. Um, so those applications see the file as a regular RDF file, such as RDF Turtle, RDF XML, JSON, RD, and so on. Right, so examples of the attributes that uh, we will use to embed RDF into our page, uh, well, um, the existing you probably know. So uh, href is a uh, attribute used with the anchor element for linking to other uh, web pages or parts of web pages. And we will reuse this attribute to link to uh, URIs of RDF resources. Sometimes you link to um, different resources in HTML using SRC, 
Um, this is in the case of um, images and videos, for instance. Um, so this element, again, typically contains a URL, and we will uh, want to reuse it. Um, and we will add some uh, new attributes which are necessary to properly represent RDF. <clears throat> now, RDFA uh, allows you to completely represent the RDF data model in HTML. So everything we know about RDF is representable in HTML attributes using RDFA. Um, and uh, those RDFA attributes can be added to basically any HTML element, um, but typically they are added to some div or span uh, elements, um, which give you a nesting of entities, uh, similarly to JSON-LD. Uh, and um, then uh, typically the anchor elements because we want to be able to, um, to get links in RDF that we already have in HTML. Uh, one goal of RDFA, which I haven't mentioned, is um, reuse. So RDFA, um, hello. Uh, RDFA uh, aims at reusing the text that is already there for people, uh, also for RDF data, which sometimes is possible uh, directly. So when there is a description of something in the web page, this can definitely be taken as it is and used in RDF uh, as a literal value. Sometimes it is not possible because of the fact that uh, web documents are uh, meant for people, for reading by people. So for instance, when you have a, a date and time in, uh, in Czech or in English even, um, that value is not compatible with the XML schema date or date time data type. So there needs to be an approach how to, uh, how to reuse the date as well. Um, and we'll talk about that one. So sometimes uh, the, the RDFA approach will reuse what is already on the web page, and sometimes we will need to add something. Right, so start with, uh, let's start with some empty, basically empty documents. So here we have an empty uh, X HTML plus RDFA 1.1 document. Uh, this is a little bit complex uh, because it combines X HTML, which nowadays is mostly deprecated in favor of HTML5. Um, but still, X HTML um, is basically HTML adhering to the rules, the stricter rules of XML. So this is an XML file. It is also an XHTML file. And since it uses uh, the RDFA 1.1 compatible uh, doc type here, we also know that this is um, parsable as an RDFA uh, file. However, it doesn't contain uh, uh, much. Um, if we took a look at the RDF triples coming out of this uh, document, we would probably get a blank node or a resource uh, with the URI of this document, and then one link to uh, example.org, and uh, this link wouldn't be actually present in the RDF statements because it is not clear which predicates should be used here. So this is really a blank document containing nothing. Uh, in regards to, to RDF. Now, I already mentioned that nowadays RDFA is mainly used with uh, HTML, uh, more specifically HTML5. And uh, a blank, again, oh, right, this is not so blank, actually. It already contains some uh, RDF triples, but this is a basic HTML plus RDFA uh, document. So it is an HTML document specified by the HTML doc type. It has a root element, HTML. Now, the language here um, applies to um, the literals coming and the RDF literals coming out of RDFA as well. So when it's stated uh, in, the, in the root element, it means that every literal value will have the English language tag here. And uh, then there are already some uh, attributes that are not part of HTML, such as vocab, type of uh, property. And those are part of RDFA, and we will talk about those uh, in a moment. So this is just an example of how an RDFA document can look like. And let's have a look at the uh, most primitive example that, that can be. And that is 
Um, an example when we want to state, for instance, a license of a document so that uh, everyone is clear that uh, they can reuse what is in the written in the document if they state uh, the author. Um, so uh, typically on a typical web page, uh, the license would be um, present like this. It would be a text, then maybe a link to the Creative Commons license with, with a text, and that would be it. So when I, as a human, read this, which can be rendered as, uh, as, uh, as is shown here in the example, uh, I know what it means, right? It means that uh, on the web page there is some content which is licensed, and uh, I can click through the license. Um, a machine doesn't understand this, because if a machine takes a look at this HTML code, all it sees is there is some text and there, then there is some link to some other web page, and that's it. No indication that this regards the license whatsoever. So um, the right hand side shows how this can be specified a little bit more using RDFA. Uh, it is almost the same, except there is the rel uh, attribute uh, with some URL uh, in addition to what we had before. And this rel attribute actually in RDFA specifies the predicate to be used in the RDF triples. And this, this means that um, the predicate connecting to the license uh, will have this particular meaning, therefore making this statement machine readable. So uh, using this, even a machine which understands the vocabulary containing this predicate will understand that there is a link to a license. Right, so let's uh, introduce some more constructs uh, used in RDFA. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, we have plain HTML with no uh, markup. And um, on the right-hand side, we add some parts of RDFA. Um, because we want to be some other RDF serializations, we, we need an attribute for that. There is the prefix attribute that has a special syntax. Uh, it contains pairs of, um, of uh, prefix names and prefix definitions. Um, so it is a list of values in um, HTML terms. And the list of values contains um, the name of the prefix, the definition of the prefix, then again, a name of another prefix, definition of another prefix, and so on. Uh, and the list is separated by spaces because spaces are illegal uh, characters, both in URLs and in names, prefix names. Once we have the prefix defined, we can use them almost as we are used to from other serializations. So we can say that this H2 uh, heading contains, um, which, which contains the text trouble with Bob, um, so uh, we say that um, the text should be a literal value connected using the DC terms title predicate. So now we already know that this is a web page that has a title, uh, the trouble with Bob. When we take a look at this RDFA file using an RDF distiller. And we can uh, continue. We can say that uh, the creator of the web page is Alice. And again, Alice will be a literal value connected to the uh, web page URL using the DC terms creator uh, predicate, as we can see uh, in the illustration. So this is the property attribute. The property attribute allows us to specify, again, a predicate IRI. And um, because it's the property attribute, the value is a literal value, uh, and uh, it comes from the content of the element on which the property attribute is present or defined. So property means two things. It specifies the IRI of the predicate, and it says that the value is a literal value coming from the content of the HTML element. It is not a link somewhere else. For that, we'll have another um, attribute. Um, right. So far, we could use only one IRI for uh, the subjects of the RDF statements. Um, and this IRI was the URL of the page itself. But this is not sufficient. We want to be able to specify our own subjects of our RDF triples. 
and uh, there may be many on one web page because one web page can contain information about many things uh, and each one needs to have an iri so for this we have or we add the about attribute the about attribute contains again an iri and it is the iri to be used as subject of the resulting triples from the subtree uh, defined by the element uh, with the about attribute so in this case, um, and by the way, I will use the divs and span a lot because those doesn't, don't mean anything from the HTML perspective, but can be used as uh, containers for RDFA attributes and typically are used for that. So even though you can use the RDFA attributes with other HTML elements, uh, the divs and spans don't mean anything in terms of HTML and can be uh, used for RDFA without uh, you thinking about what, how this looks like in, in HTML. Um, right, so divs are for nesting and spans are for um, basically annotating texts. <clears throat> right, so here uh, the uppermost div has the page URL as a subject of the resulting triples and uh, it just defines the prefix. Enter no actual triples with this uh, subject uh, distilled from, from this document. And then we have two divs. Each is about a different, um, let's say, uh, blog post. Uh, and uh, so with the about attribute, we define the IRI of that particular blog post. And uh, the subtree of this div attribute contains, again, two headings with the predicate specified and the values, resulting in uh, four triples, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. So now we have a web page containing triples about two things. Uh, and it is clear that for every RDF triple uh, coming from the subtree of an element with an about attribute defined, this value of the about attribute is used as subject in the RDF triples. Now, uh, because HTML supports nesting, we have to deal with, uh, well, we need to know what to do when there are multiple uh, nest nesting levels, each defining uh, their own about uh, value, and uh, it works as expected. So um, when we have a property here, it results into an R uh, in an RDF triple, and the subject of the triple is the closest about value that we have. So uh, the uppermost div here produces uh, trouble with Bob as a value of um, attached using the decedent's title predicate to the uh, Alice post trouble with Bob IRI. But then when we go deeper and we define another uh, about value uh, on this div, the triples coming from, uh, let's say, this property, beautiful sunset, um, uses the closest about value as the subject producing uh, these triples. So uh, this is nesting. The rule is simple. The, the closest uh, about value to uh, the property or resource attribute producing an actual triple is used as the subject. Um, now, there is a special support for uh, stating types of things. Uh, we could use um, the relation RDF type for that uh, somehow, but in RDF there is a special support for that because it is uh, a, uh, the, the most commonly used triple saying that something is of some type. Uh, and that special support is in the form of the type of attribute. Uh, but it has two functions actually. Uh, one is that it will produce the triple that something has an RDF type of person in this case. But also, if no about attribute is specified, uh, it means that a blank node will be created of this particular type. So it has two, two functions like this. So here, there is no about attribute, which means that a blank node of this type will be created. And then um, this blank node will be a full person having this full name and, uh, um, and some other, uh, other uh, RDF triples. Another attribute that we can uh, see used here is the rel attribute that we had in the initial example with the license. Uh, the rel attribute again 
<clears throat> specifies or defines the IRI of an RDF predicate. But this time, uh, this predicate uh, connects to a value of, uh, um, and, and the value is an RDF resource identified by an IRI, not a literal. So for literals, we have the property attribute and for uh, IRIs of resources, we have the rel attribute. So rel again creates a triple and uh, the question is where it gets the URL of the RDF object that it generates. And the answer is um, that on, uh, on A elements, it's the href attribute. On uh, IMG elements for pictures, it's the src attribute. And um, on other elements, and uh, there is the resource attribute that we cannot see here, but we'll see it in, in a little bit that allows us to specify the target, the, the, the RDF object in that state. So uh, we have the blank node. It is of a type for person. Um, and there is a fourth name, it's a mailbox and phone from fourth. I noticed that uh, those are IRIs. So an email address and a telephone number represented as an IRI using the rel attribute to specify the predicate. Um, okay, so the rel attribute again, now we already know for which it is, for, for what it is used. Um, so here we'll have a um, full profile, uh, it's about, me and uh, now here we illustrate another uh, use case. Uh, we say using the rel attribute that we use the fourth nose predicate to connect to other IRI uh, other RDF resources. Those resources need to be identified either by IRIs or they need to be blank nodes. That that comes quite naturally from uh, the RDF data model. So we have already seen how we can connect to other IRIs using the, uh, the href and the src attributes. But here, uh, we actually connect to blank nodes. Um, and those blank nodes are specified as list items, um, each of the list items has the type of um, attribute mean end, and therefore this, relation actually takes the individual list items, the nested elements uh, as uh, the targets of the uh, RDF triple, RDF link. So it will look like this. We have um, Alice, this is a relative IRI, just hash, hash me. So it gets, uh, it, well, it gets added to the URL of the web page, and uh, the resulting URL is this. And Alice knows two blank nodes, which are which come from the list items. They are both of the type for person, and uh, one has the name Bob, and one has the name Eve. And uh, here we can see how the property attribute and the rel attribute actually can be used on a single HTML element, because the property says, okay, the content of the element will get connected as a literal value using false name. And the href attribute will get connected uh, using the full homepage here. So uh, we can also combine those attributes um, like this. Right, so now uh, we are able to, um, to, to create literal values and links to uh, resources. We are able to specify our own subjects uh, or subject IRIs. And so, we can already represent quite a substantial subset of RDF in HTML. What we are not able to do so far is to specify data types of literals. We are able to specify language tags because those can be specified using the lang attribute um, in HTML. But for data types, um, there needs to be a special approach. I already have mentioned this, that especially with dates, there is a big difference between um, how a date and time is displayed for people to read and for machines to understand. Um, we have already seen this in the RDF uh, tutorials where we played a little bit with the syntaxes of uh, XML schema dates and date times. And uh, here, um, this 
issue is manifested again, where we want to say that um, this uh, web page was modified and we want to say when it was modified. Now, quite naturally for people, we want to say it was modified on the 16th of September, 2015, because people will not read an XML date time representation of a date, right? But to make this information machine readable, we need to be able to express um, the same information as an XML schema data type. Um, so for that, we have the content attribute, which basically overrides the content of the element with another value. So here we use the property attribute saying that uh, we will connect this URI to um, using DC terms modified to some value. And normally with the property, attribute, the value would be taken from the content of the HTML element. But since there is the content attribute, this is not the case and the value will, uh, will be taken from the, uh, as the value from the content attribute. This means that people will still, still see the content of the HTML element, but machines will see the content of the content attribute. And in addition to this, uh, we can specify the data type, which is again the array of the data type as we are used to. So in this case, it is XML schema date time. So like this, we are able to represent also arbitrary uh, data types and we are able to override some values which would normally become RDF literals uh, using the uh, content attribute, which uh, on the other hand is not rendered um, in an HTML browser. So people don't see this and machine do, machines do. <coughs> so uh, let's get one step further. Here uh, we have uh, a div. We want to say that Albert Einstein is this one from, uh, why not? Remember that uh, um, every time you need to link to somewhere, you can always link to the Wikipedia. So here we all say, okay, Albert Einstein is this one from, from the Wikipedia using the about, right? And we will say that his name is Albert Einstein and his date of birth um, now here, we can see the data type used with the actual content of the element. It is not very human readable, but uh, why not in this case? And we want to say that uh, Albert Einstein was, was born in Germany. So we can do this. We say uh, using the rel attribute that he has a birthplace and uh, we say the resource attribute that the RDF object is in this case, this IRI again from the VPN, uh, Germany. And people will see Federal Republic of Germany, so all is well. However, we also want to make the name of the country machine readable. So we say property, this is a DVPedia convention long name. Uh, and now we have a problem, right? Because if we follow the rule about the closest about value, we would end up uh, with saying that uh, Albert Einstein has a conventional long name, Federal Republic of Germany, which is not the case. Here, the technique called chaining comes into effect, where basically when we use this construct that uh, we define the resource as an object of the resulting RDF statement, this object gets used as a subject for all triples coming from um, the nested uh, elements. So this is actually the same as uh, if we had also an about um, about attribute somewhere here, or if this was actually encompassed or nested within a div having the about attribute with this value. But this might be surprising the first time you work with RDFA that there is no about value with Germany and still Germany then appears as the subject of, of some triples, but it is quite natural if you take uh, all imagine this, this use case. Now, there are some syntactic shortcuts that you may use with RDFA. Uh, let's have this example. So again, we have Albert Einstein, uh, and we want to say that uh, he has two citizenships, one uh, with Germany and one in the United States. 
uh, and we can do it uh, using techniques that we already know like this. But we have some repetition, right? We have uh, the repetition of, of um, the specification of the predicate here. We can do uh, or state the same thing uh, like this. So we have the same about here, but then we replace the repetition of uh, this um, uh, IRI of the predicate with nesting. So we say, okay, and here we have a diff element with the relationship definition. Uh, and within it, we have two spans, each about uh, a different country. So these two uh, notations are the same. They produce the same RDF triples, um, but this one uses uh, the HTML nesting for that. And it is also the same as um, using about and well on the uppermost div, and then just specifying the two countries. So all these three um, notations produce the same RDF triples. Right. So that was uh, that was basically it for RDFA. Uh, there is one um, connected specification to RDFA, and that is called RDFA Lite, uh, which actually got some uh, traction and is implemented somewhere. And, and RDFA Lite is nothing more than a subset of RDFA uh, focusing on uh, those attributes or containing only those attributes which you can see used in this example. So there is type of, there is property, there is vocab, uh, of course, the href and type of and, and resource. And uh, that's it, nothing more. So um, no uh, data types, no language tags. Uh, so it is easier. Um, but again, it doesn't allow you to, uh, to use the entire RDF data model. Right, so to recap uh, the attributes that uh, we used, uh, we reused these attributes that you already know from HTML. So we reused the rel attribute uh, for connecting to uh, another IRI uh, and yeah, another resource identified by an IRI. Uh, one attribute that we did mention, but it is already in HTML is the ref attribute, which is the reverse direction of the rel attribute saying that Actually, the object will be the subject of the triple and the subject will be the object of the triple specified uh, or connected using the predicate in, in this ref attribute. So if we uh, had, uh, I don't know, um, Albert Einstein has citizenship Germany and this was, um, this was uh, stated using the rel attribute, uh, we could have uh, Germany as the uppermost div, then ref citizenship and then Albert Einstein uh, nested within, uh, within this um, Germany uh, div. For instance, if we had a uh, list of citizens of Germany and we still wanted to use the uh, citizenship predicate in its original direction, then we would use ref. Content uh, for uh, specifying readable alternatives to, to some texts and href and src for uh, specifying URLs of, of, of targets or objects in RDF statements. So those attributes we already uh, know, and we added these. So we added about for specifying subjects uh, of triples. We added property for specifying credits uh, connecting to RDF value, uh, lit literal. We added resource for specifying the objects of RDF triples. Uh, which are not specified by href or src. We added data types for specifying data types of RDF literals, type of for the special, uh, for introducing blank nodes and stating the types of those blank nodes. And uh, we introduced vocab for the case where we use one vocabulary for the entire HTML document. Again, this is basically used only for schema.org, which we will talk about next time. Uh, but you may have already uh, come across schema.org uh, because schema.org uh, aims to have a markup for everything. Um, you can use vocab with that and uh, save yourself the hassle with uh, prefixes. And in this attribute, 
which you can use to construct the RDF list, which is the linked list allowing you to preserve order uh, of RDF uh, values. Right, and uh, the last thing I want to uh, talk about in regards to RDFA is this it is more of a historical thing, uh, but uh, you might have already uh, seen in, in the table here that some of the content type values um, are defined as safe query. Well, query is a compact URI expression, uh, which means a URI using a prefix. Nothing more. So that's quite clear. So this DB uh, colon and something is a compact URI expression. However, there is one issue historically um, because um, when you use uh, a value like this, it is not clear whether the DB here is actually a prefix name or an IRI schema because this could be also an IRI with the DB schema and this as the part of the IRI. Um, with RDFA 1.1, it is clear that the parser should first resolve all the prefixes. And then uh, when the parser comes across this kind of value, it first looks at the prefix definitions. And if it finds the prefix named like this, it is a prefix URI. And if it doesn't find a prefix like this, it is an absolute IRI with this uh, schema. Uh, but this functionality might not be uh, implemented in some older parsers. And therefore, uh, in places where uh, both can be encountered, both prefix and absolute IRIs, it is safer to use the IRI like this with, within brackets. And that's what is called a safe query. Um, because this is no longer um, a syntactically correct absolute uh, URI, and it is clear that it needs to be processed as a prefix. Please, uh, one uh, is a document somewhere. So, uh, this is what it is. So, this is RDFA, uh, the, the first way of actually embedding structured data in a web page. And uh, an RDFA document can be parsed as a regular RDF uh, document. So this is something we already know. But it is not the uh, oldest approach to actually embedding uh, machine-readable data in a web page. It is compatible with RDF, which cannot be said about the other approaches we are going to talk about. But there are microformats, which is the oldest way of actually embedding some structured data within HTML. And it works in a different way than RDFA. First of all, it doesn't produce any RDF data. It just allows uh, applications which understand the microformats specification to extract some pieces of uh, machine readable data from a web page in a proprietary way. Um, so with microformats, humans come first, machines second. Uh, and uh, an example of a microformat can be seen here. So this is hCard, which um, is basically something we know as a vCard from RDF, but it is a machine readable representation of the card you give to someone when you uh, want them to contact you. Um, so it is for contact information. Um, in HTML, we have the address element, uh, which says, this part of the HTML web page contains some kind of contact information, but nothing more. So if in plain HTML, you would have uh, this link to a web page of someone, um, again, it is not machine readable. If you want to make it machine readable using microformats, the class attribute can contain any um, List of, uh, list of arbitrary values. The class names typically in HTML are used for styling using CSS style sheets um, or for JavaScript targeting pieces of, a, of the HTML um, tree. Um, but in this case, the class names, when they are, uh, uh, they are just specified like this. So if, uh, so the microformat specification gives you a list of class names to use to annotate pieces of um, 
of HTML. So here we know that fn class means that the element contains the full name and the URL class means that uh, the href attribute contains the link to the web page of that person. And if you have an application understanding these conventions, that uh, you have a V card which contains FN and URL classes, you can parse uh, the conduct information out of this. Um, so another, uh, another example, a bigger one, we have a piece of HTML code here. And again, we have the class V card, which means that any compatible application will know that here we are defining a V card. And here we have the full name and the URL. Uh, and here we have another V card with full name URL and org class, which says that this is a contact information for an organization, not the person. So as you can see, this is all proprietary. Uh, you cannot use any class names uh, unless you specify also the micro format to, to go with them. Um, but if you use the proper class names, then you get some um, machine readable data in compatible applications. There are other micro formats which are used on the web. Some of those you might not even realize that they are actually micro formats because some of them are very simple, like this one, rel no follow, which just uh, defines one particular relationship called no follow, uh, which says that um, search engines such as Google and Bing should not go through this link and index what's, um, what's on the other side. Um, and yeah, it just defines the no follow keyword that you can use as, as rel. Um, the tag uh, micro format here can be used to specify keywords of a web page. And there is also a micro format for calendar events. So here you have an event with a summary, a date and the location. So those are basically class names with assigned meaning. Uh, now micro formats went through an evolution and now actually uh, what is supported is something called Microformats 2. Uh, and uh, Microformats 2 add some additional, uh, additional syntactic magic uh, to the format, making the code simpler. So if uh, in Microformats 1, we had a V card with a full name and URL classes to, to specify that we have sent with a home page. The same thing in microformats too can be done just by saying this is a H card and that's it. Because um, there are rules specified in the microformats to a specification of H card saying that if nothing else is specified, the value is the name of the person and the link is the link to the uh, home page. And therefore this doesn't have to be explicitly mentioned. There are also rules to how you um, uh, how you produce your microformats to specifications. Uh, and they are quite simple. Basically, class names starting with H uh, specify that here we have a section with some data according to some microformats to specification. Uh, P stands for plain text. So this uh, is used for plain text values. U is used for URLs, uh, DT for date times, and E for HTML content. Um, and if you follow this uh, convention, you can create your own microformats uh, to specification. The issue here, of course, is that when you create your microformat specification, um, you also need to create the application looking for that specific microformat in the uh, web page. Otherwise, it just gets ignored as just another class name in HTML. Uh, here we have an example with uh, an H card, which is a plain text value, and then a URL of a web page, which again is the URL. So you can see the conventions used in, uh, in practice. Right, just an overview of existing microformats to vocabularies. So the specifications are called vocabularies. We have seen H card, there is H event for events, H recipe for recipes, uh, and review aggregates for basically providing search engines with uh, those stars. So this might be uh, used in an eShop 
where you want to say that your users of your eShop rates this particular item uh, as a four star item and five star item. So you embed this in your data and Google understands and shows this in their search results. Uh, right. Maybe you are wondering if uh, microformats can be um, transformed to RDF as well. And they can. It is quite simple. You just use this special microformats vocab uh, keyword in or, or attribute in RDFA. And then instead of uh, class specifying uh, the uh, microformat vocabulary, you use type of. And then instead of the classes specifying the individual attributes, uh, you use property. And like this, you can have uh, microformats converted to RDFA if you wanted to. The advantage of RDFA is that it's universal. So you can use it for your own vocabularies and all the distillers and all this will still work, which is not the case for microformats. Right, so uh, we have seen RDFA and we have seen microformats, but this is not uh, all. There is yet another specification of uh, how you can embed um, data into web pages. And there is also a fourth one, which we'll talk about next time. But uh, and this one is actually part of the current HTML specification. Uh, <clears throat> and it aims to uh, provide access to the embedded data to a DOM parser. DOM stands for Document Object Model. And that is the object representation of an HTML document that you use when you manipulate your website using JavaScript within browser, let's say. Um, so uh, HTML macrodata is part of the HTML application and uh, uh, aims at making access to the embedded data as simple as possible from JavaScript uh, in a web browser. Uh, it, is, uh, it used to be a W3C working draft uh, and uh, nowadays, since HTML itself is no longer uh, a specification managed by W3C because it, uh, it was transferred to another standardization body, um, microdata is now also part of this specification, so also managed by another standardization body, but still it is a, uh, a part of a web standard. Um, right. So it is very similar to what RDFA allows you to do. It just calls the same things, um, different names, and it, it, it is a little bit simpler. Um, but uh, it is very comparable, let's say, to RDFA Lite, which I mentioned, which is a subset of RDFA. So for now, things are called items in uh, RDF, uh, in HTML microdata. So things are items. Uh, literals are values and uh, properties are properties. And uh, let's take a look at how microdata can be embedded in HTML. So first of all, we all want to say in the HTML code that at some places we have some items. Uh, we do that by using the item scope attribute. So using the item scope attribute, in some places we say there is one thing or item, there is another item here, and um, that's it for now, nothing more. We just say where the items are. Now we all want to say uh, the type of those items. And for that, we have the item type attribute. So we'll add item type and those will be schema.org URIs uh, of classes. Um, you can use um, also other vocabularies, but typically, again, um, microdata is used with schema.org. Um, right, so now we know there is a person and there is an event, and here we have an address. Now, these items will have properties, and for that, we'll have the item prop attribute. Since microdata is often enough used with uh, schema.org, those are uh, properties from schema.org. Um, so here we'll say that there is a person with this name, uh, with this title, and from this organization. Uh, so now we have item scope, item type, and item prop. And we can go on. 
So a bigger example here, uh, we have an uh, event. We know it, uh, it's an item and uh, its type. Uh, the item, uh, the event has a URL and um, the URL is taken again from href, which is already in HTML. And there is a summary and a description. And uh, there is a specification of start date and end date. Uh, here, there is another approach of actually dealing with human readable dates because the human readable date stays within the HTML element, but the machine readable date is provided using the date time attribute. So instead of uh, content and data type in RDFA, we have date time uh, for, uh, for microdata. And there is a location. Again, it's an item of a type address and has properties street address, postal code, and locality. So very similar to RDFA, but different. Uh, now there is a set of rules saying, where do you get the value for your properties? Um, and it is based on uh, the element on which you have the properties. Um, so if the element is uh, one of these, you get uh, the value from the SRC attribute. If it is a meta, then you get uh, the content, uh, the value from the content attribute. From these, you get the href attribute and uh, time has uh, date time uh, attribute and so on. So there is a list of rules saying on top of which HTML elements um, or based on which HTML element you from. Right, uh, one thing that uh, we didn't mention yet is item ref, which allows you to have information about one item spread across the entire HTML document. So let's say we have, a inform we have information about the person here, uh, and uh, then we have some other content on the web page, and somewhere in the bottom, we have uh, friends of this person, and so somewhere completely else, elsewhere, we have a other list of, uh, of friends, let's say. And we want all those to actually be uh, properties of the item person on top of the web page. We can do this using item ref, and item ref basically says uh, that uh, in a piece of a web page with this particular ID, the description of this item continues. So uh, the name, title, and the organization of this person is in this div, but then other properties like friends are in this div, and yet another uh, set of properties is uh, connected um, in this div. So like this, you can have properties about one item spread uh, over the entire HTML document and connect them using item ref. Now there is some support for uh, specifying uh, URLs of things or items in this case, and that is item ID. So you can say that this item is identified by um, a URL using item ID. So that's again, similar to the about uh, attribute in RDFA. Right, so this was microdata. Uh, what it allows you to do is uh, use it easily in JavaScript uh, in your web browser like this. You can, you have the document and you can call get items, uh, the URL of the predicate, and you get uh, a field or an array of all items uh, of all values connected um, using this property. Uh, actually, all items uh, of this type, I think this is the item type. So yeah, you get a set of items of this type. You get the first one as a user, and uh, you can display um, the, the name of the user like this. So it is quite easy to work with the embedded uh, data from within JavaScript. Uh, in RDFA, you would have a distiller, which distills an RDF graph, and then you would have to parse the graph. So this is a little bit um, easier. And now the fourth, fourth way of embedding uh, metadata or embedding data, machine readable data into a web page um, is uh, using JSON-LD. So you'll have a, a script element in your HTML web page. And this script element would contain a piece of JSON-LD. Uh, and uh, this is actually the preferred way nowadays uh, 
uh, when using schema.org. So um, Google, let's say as a search engine, the primary user of uh, the embedded um, data first uh, supported microformats and supported RDFA. Then uh, it started supporting microdata and um, basically deprecated microformats and RDFA. And nowadays they prefer using uh, JSON-LD scripts or JSON-LD snippets embedded directly in the web page. So if you take a look at, um, let's say, a favorite eShop of yours, and if you take a look at the HTML source uh, of uh, the web pages about products they have there, you will probably find a script element with JSON-LD uh, using schema.org embedded there. Right, so those were um, four ways of embedding machine-readable data into, uh, into web pages. Any questions regarding this? In your assignments, um, the, the last part of the assignment is actually that you will create a simple web page showing some of the data that you work with. Um, so part of this assignment is that you also embed machine readable representation uh, of the data you are showing in that uh, HTML page, uh, preferably using RDFA, so that the distilled RDF is the same as the RDF you use to create the web page. So that's um, uh, basically how this concerns you. Uh, right, so uh, let's move on to the second topic of today's uh, lecture. And the second topic of today's lecture is Sparkle Update, uh, which is um, another of uh, the family of Sparkle specifications, uh, the web standards for querying um, data in RDF databases. But this time uh, we will add um, the Sparkle update part, which allows you to actually manipulate the data in the RDF database is also using Sparkle. So um, this means deleting data, adding data, and managing named graphs uh, that you have in, uh, in your RDF database. Yeah, right. So what we know so far about Sparkle is this. You can use it for querying. Um, and uh, when you use your uh, rough pattern, it gets matched against the data you have in your RDF database. And it produces a solutions table, uh, which looks like this. And then with the solutions table, you can either return the solutions table using Sparkle Select, or you can use the solutions table to, um, to create another RDF graph using Sparkle construct, or you can ask whether there is at least one solution using Sparkle ask. And um, yeah, so those are use cases for, for the solutions table. And now uh, we are going to talk about how you can actually use this to insert and delete uh, data from and to the database. Um, so this is another specification, adding this functionality to Sparkle. It was not there um, before Sparkle 1.1, so it is, uh, well, it's no longer new, but uh, relatively new. Um, and uh, we'll start with something very simple. Now, uh, we need to realize that what uh, the RDF databases actually implement is what we know as the RDF data set. So, an RDF data set is a set of named graphs and one default graph which contain the RDF triples. So that is what is implemented by the triple stores, which are actually quad stores or simply RDF databases. So when we, when we query this data, we have the choice. Either we specify the named graphs we want to query explicitly, or we do not. And then depending on the implementation, either we query all the graphs in there, or we query just the default graph, <clears throat> which is fine. But with updates, it is not that simple because um, when we want to delete some piece of data or add some data, we always need to know, or the implementation needs to know uh, which name graph or uh, which graph we are actually modifying. Um, so the simplest thing 
from Sparkle update is the insert data clause. With the insert data, you get a list of quads and, uh, or you provide the list of quads and those are the quads that get inserted into the database and that's it. There is no querying, no variables, no filters and so on. What you specify in the insert data clause gets inserted into the database. So an example, we had a graph uh, named example slash bookstore uh, with this one triple um, book with the title fundamentals of compiler design. And we want to insert data into this graph. And we want to say that this book has a price 42. So we actually are inserting one RDF quad into the data. And not surprisingly, uh, the data after this operation looks like this. There is the book with the title that was there before and the price that got inserted. So insert data, quite simple. It doesn't allow any querying. You need to explicitly state all the quads that get inserted. The same operation for deletion, for deletion of data is delete data. So again, you specify the RDF quads which you want to delete and they get deleted. So that's uh, quite straightforward. And um, in this case, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have a typo in, in the data. Uh, yeah, there is a typo. So it's fundamentals of compiler design, but the design has a typo in it and we want to correct that. So we first delete this quad and then we insert the correct one. After we execute this query, which is actually one query, it has the delete data clause, then a semicolon, and then the insert data clause. So after this, that will be the correct quad. So again, very straightforward. There is nothing to it, um, but also it is not very powerful. Now, what resembles more the Sparkle querying we are used to is the delete insert clause. The delete insert clause um, actually contains the where clause, which uh, gets used for uh, graph pattern matching as we are used to from querying the data. Uh, and um, it, it again can be used to delete and to insert quads. Um, but this time it supports the whole querying power of, of Sparkle. The query looks like this. Um, there is the where clause, which does the pattern, uh, the graph pattern matching and all this. It supports everything we are used to. So the re result of the where clause is the solution stable, as we have seen in the first slide here. So here we get the solution stable. The question is what we do with the solution stable. And the answer here is when we use the delete clause, uh, we again provide an RDF uh, template similar to the Sparkle construct, where we basically populated the RDF template with the records from the solutions table. And the result was an RDF graph, which got returned as a result of a Sparkle construct query. Here, instead of construct, we have delete. And the, the difference here is that whatever gets constructed using this RDF template gets deleted from the database. So it is not returned as a result of the query, but it is deleted from the database. Uh, so um, when we take a look here, we query for all people and with a given name Fred and all triples uh, about Fred, and we want to delete those. So if before we had data about William and about Fred in our database, after the execution of this query, we have only data about William because data about Fred was deleted. If you switched delete for construct here, you would get exactly the RDF triples that got deleted from the database using delete. Um, right, it is called delete slash insert clause because here you can have the delete clause and you can also continue the same query with a insert clause, which gets another RDF template and uh, with the same functionality, whatever gets constructed using this RDF template gets inserted into the database. So you can have a delete something, insert something, and where uh, something, and it works all as one query. Now, 
you need to specify the graph you are actually using for the query. Um, so there is a keyword with which overrides the, the default. Um, so um, if you say with and URI of a name graph and then delete insert where, it is the same as if you would say delete from this, uh, this graph insert into this graph using this graph where, and using is the same as from. So basically uh, it says that you are querying this particular graph. So that's the with keyword and uh, the using keyword, where using is the same as from. Um, now the question might be, why do we introduce another keyword which has the same functionality of, uh, as from? And it is because it would be weird to read the query before uh, insert this from this particular graph. It doesn't make sense in English. That's why uh, for Sparkle update, and there is the using keyword. So insert this using um, the graph. It sounds better, but if you would use from here, it would also work. Uh, there is also a syntactic shortcut, which is already there for construct. Uh, for querying using construct, but um, it is a common use case that you actually query for some triples and then you want to delete those. Or you query for some triples and you want to return them as a result of Sparkle construct. So if those two um, templates would be the same, you can omit one of those and just say delete where and specify the triples. And those triples that match this pattern get deleted. Uh, construct where works as well. There is one, uh, one catch here, and that is that this gets really rewritten into, into this, which means that there is no support for filters, binds, and, and so on, which normally you can specify in the where clause because they would get also copied into the delete or construct clause, and that doesn't make any sense. So if your query is very simple like this, you can use this syntactic shortcut. Right, so that was uh, Sparkle update. So using this, you can query your endpoint and delete data and insert data, uh, either specifically using the insert data and delete data calls or based on results of uh, querying the endpoint and that's the delete slash insert calls. Now, uh, when you imagine uh, or remember that we talked about various use cases for named graphs in RDF in the lecture, uh, about uh, linked data patterns. Uh, we talked about how you can use name graphs for, uh, for particular resources or for particular aspects or for different data sets in the endpoint and so on. And um, it, when you think about it, if you want to delete all the data from one graph and replace it with um, another graph and so on, it would be quite tedious to do that using Spark update because you would always have to say uh, delete all triples matching something from from the from a graph uh, and insert some other triples and so on. So it would be easier to actually manipulate the named graphs as uh, first class citizens. And there is a part of the Spark update specification just for this and uh, regarding graph management. So now. We are going to talk about named graphs uh, as um, the whole sets of triples without actually looking inside. So we can, uh, you can imagine this as uh, manipulating files containing triples. It is very similar. Um, so here uh, we have operations on top of whole named graphs. We can, uh, and this is one of uh, the nice features of Sparkle, we can load, uh, an RDF file that we have somewhere on the web. So, so you find a turtle file somewhere on the web and you can load it into a named graph like this. So if you have a Sparkle update endpoint, you say load the IRI of the file into graph and the IRI of the named graph. And the triple store downloads the data and loads it into this named graph. So it is very simple and efficient. Uh, you can also clear the graph when you no longer need the data. So this deletes all the triples in this graph. Uh, and to, because um, the uh, triple stores uh, implement the RDF data set, uh, they also have support for operations clearing the default graph or only the named graphs or all graphs. So those are all keywords 
uh, regarding the RDF data set. Again, a set of name graphs um, and one default graph. So you can clear those and load data into those. Now, uh, there is, uh, or regarding the functionality of deleting and creating graphs, um, they are actually, um, they are actually two approaches which can be implemented in a triple store. Uh, one approach treats uh, the named graph as dependent on its content. So when there is at least one triple in a named graph, the named graph exists. And when this last triple gets deleted from the named graph, the named graph itself ceases to exist. That's one approach. Another approach is that named graphs exist even if they are empty. And therefore you need some syntax to create those and delete those independently of the content. If that is the case, then you can use create graph and drop graph. In the implementations where um, this actually, uh, where you cannot have an empty name graph, those are equivalent to, um, well, create is an empty statement and drop graph is then equivalent to clear graph. But in implementations where you could have an empty name graph, those two differ uh, because one only clears all the triples from the name graph, keeping the graph intact but drop actually also deletes the name graph. Um, right, and because you can treat name graphs as files, you can also do the usual operations. So there is support for copy and move uh, of graphs. And again, here we can see that we copy a name graph into default graph and we move uh, the graph into default graph. And um, the meaning of this is the usual one as if uh, you would uh, you were copying files. So copy actually deletes the target and copies all the triples into the target data graph, uh, uh, RDF graph. Move also deletes the, the, uh, the source graph after, uh, after the copy ends. And there is one special operation which can be there because we know that in fact, named graphs contain RDF triples and that is the add operation. The add operation takes all the triples from the source graph and adds them to the target graph, keeping the source graph intact. So this is kind of a merge, uh, which can be done because we know that uh, inside those named graphs, we have already triples. Yeah, so an example of the add operation. So we'll add the default graph to this named graph. Um, so if before in the default graph, we had uh, data about William and in the name graph, we had uh, the triple saying that Fred is a person and we add default to the name one. After this operation, the default graph still contains data about William, but the name graph contains data about William, which got added to the one triple saying that Fred is a person. Um, yeah, so this is the add graph operation. Yeah, so this was Sparkle update, the specification. Um, which is implemented by all common RDF, uh, RDF databases. So to finish this lecture, uh, I will shortly talk about three most commonly used uh, RDF databases. Uh, and those are Opening Virtuoso, Eclipse RDF4J and Apache Jena uh, Suseki. All those are open source. You can uh, use them, take a look at how they are implemented if you want. I want to, uh, and of course you can use those for your semester of projects uh, for loading data, querying data and building applications on top of. Um, first, I'm going to talk about OpenLink Virtuoso. Uh, this one is quite an old one and uh, it has an open source version and then a commercial version. So it is uh, possible to actually pay for commercial level support uh, of the product. Um, and if you decide to use Virtuoso when you install it, uh, what you'll get is this conductor application, web application for management of uh, the database. One important fact about Virtuoso is that it is not a native RDF uh, database. It is actually a relational database, which has um, a level um, of, or, or layer 
uh, implemented, enabling you to use it as an RDF database. So it provides you with a Sparkle endpoint and storage of RDF, but inside it is a relational database. So there is a proprietary mapping of RDF data into um, some relational tables. And since it is also a relational database, you can take a look at how those uh, relational tables look like, and you can query them using SQL if you, if you wish to. Uh, <clears throat> so if you install uh, Virtuoso, you'll get also a Spark endpoint running on the 8890 uh, port if you don't change this configuration. Um, the configuration can be found in a Virtuoso INI file, which um, you can use to, uh, well, configure the database. There are very many options that you can tweak in the, um, in, in the file. And uh, some of those are not very well documented. And that is understanding of how to set those options correctly is part of the commercial service on top of, uh, on top of the product. Um, what you also get when you use Virtuoso is the faceted browser which allows you to click through your data when you load it into the database. You can click through uh, the data rendered as HTML pages. This is something I really recommend. Um, so um, if you didn't see your data in a clickable form yet, try to install Virtuoso and uh, load your data and use the faceted browser to actually see uh, your data in a click clickable way. It is an entirely different view of your data uh, than when you see it just in a notepad or just your code, because suddenly you see it as web pages, as machines would see the data, and um, you might see some uh, errors and uh, issues you have in the data uh, more clearly this way. So this is opening Virtuoso. Um, I think that's... Uh, that's all I wanted to say about it. Uh, right, performance-wise, uh, Virtuoso is uh, the most performant out of the three, even though it is not a native RDF database. Uh, so for, uh, for bigger uh, graphs, it might, uh, it might be beneficial to use, uh, to use Virtuoso. However, with RDF graphs, the size of your semester project or your typical semester project, um, all of those three are fine. Um, the second one I want to talk about is, uh, yeah, is Eclipse RDF4J. So this one is maintained by the um, Eclipse ecosystem. Um, and um, again, when you inst uh, this one is Java based, uh, so it runs on Java. And uh, when you install it into a Java uh, servlet container, such as uh, Apache Tomcat or Jetty or something like that, uh, you get two applications. One is the RDF4J server, which actually contains the implementation of uh, the database. And then you get an RDF4J workbench, which is a web application for people to be able to actually work with the database. And again, it allows you to query the data and so on. One interesting fact is that historically RDF4J um, uses the term context, and context is nothing else than a named graph. Uh, but in RDF4J, it is called a context for some reason. Um, right. So this one, uh, yeah, is Java-based. It is a native triple store, um, and it, con it actually contains many different implementations. Of, uh, of triple stores, some with reasoning capabilities, some without, uh, and, and so on. So yeah, this one is uh, also nice to know. And an alternative to, to this is Apache Jira uh, which is again, a native Java-based triple store. Uh, it is of the three, it is the easiest to run because you just download the binaries and you run the server and that's it. It is also the strictest regarding to the Sparkle specification. So in Virtuoso, it is possible to run queries which are not exactly up to the specification. Uh, in Fuseki, this is not the case. They go strictly uh, by the specification. 
So uh, if your query works with Seki, it will probably work with all crypto stones as well. Um, it is quite easy to have a RDF file and uh, just say run a Sparkle server on top of this RDF file as a single command line command and um, it runs. It runs on the, uh, on, by default on the port 3030. Um, and uh, its configuration is um, done using a RDF turtle file. So uh, it uses RDF also for its own configuration. Um, we will talk about RDF4J and uh, Apache Jena uh, in another lecture regarding APIs and libraries for working with RDF because uh, both Apache Jena and Eclipse RDF4J are not only implementations of a triple store, but also frame, entire frameworks and libraries for working with uh, RDF data in Java. Uh, right. And uh, that is it. So any questions regarding this? So the next tutorial is uh, in uh, three weeks, I think. So there's plenty of time uh, for you to maybe try uh, running one of those and loading your data into, uh, into one of those. Um, yep, so if there are no more questions, uh, next week there is a holiday. So I'll see you on the lecture in two weeks.